about this. First of all, before we start, um, we do have an online version of this, but the, the player that we use, the Unity Web Player, is sometimes not supported anymore by some browsers, and it is a little clunkier because it sometimes gets confused between the client and the web browser itself. So if you go to this webpage, hbar.com.au, there's a Mac version and a Win32 version that you can download. Um, the Mac version should work fine, as it is the one I'm using here. Um, the Win32, I'm not sure. I just got it compiled, but I haven't tested it because I don't have a Windows machine. So what is this platform, Aquanix, and, and what is it designed to do? Um, I'm actually quite grateful for Nathan's talk this morning because it helps lead into this a little bit. Is We're sort of now talking about the more lower level optimization. So this is based on hardware models that employ the surface code or the Rausendorf code. And the question is, um, when we convert these circuits, and our starting points are really these sort of optimized circuits, um, Clifford plus T libraries, or whatever's done at the higher level, that's our starting point. From that point, we construct these geometric structures that represent how it would be implemented in a surface code quantum computer. And the idea of Maquonics, and the original motivation for it was that we were doing all of this by hand, um, just using Google SketchUp and we were making a lot of mistakes. Um, so we thought, well, we'll program in this, the rules into some kind of program, and then you know, the computer will take care of the rules and we don't have to worry about having to redo it 10 or 20 times. And this sort of evolved into a game, um, primarily because we haven't proven it yet, but we strongly suspect that the optimization problem is going to be computationally inefficient. So we'll have to use some kind of techniques such as AI or machine learning, and we need to teach the computer how to do it. So we thought we'd crowdsource it. We try and turn this into a game, get players to play it, and then generate large data sets that we can then use for automatic optimization of much larger circuits. And I'm talking again tomorrow on sort of the background uh, to this. So how you construct these things, what are the rules in constructing these things, how big they can get, and a lot of the restrictions involved. So this is more of the demo of the game itself. So what's the idea? The idea is we start with one of these circuits, we compile it into this, what we call canonical form. And the, comp the mapping's very, very straightforward. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about you know, what all of this means and trying to teach you topological quantum computing. I don't have the time. But you can sort of see roughly where the, the mapping comes in. We have pairs of defects here in the surface code. These correspond to these eight qubit lines here. This is the state distillation circuit for a phase gate or an S gate. So it requires seven qubits or eight qubits, seven encoded into the steam code, and then we teleport and basically distill the output here. And then we have these braiding structures that represent the C knots. So we have this loop here, which is this C knot. We have single control multiple target C knots. And these pyramid structures here represent the injection points of low fidelity uh, magic states, which we then distill. So if we get trivial syndrome results coming out here, the output here will be a high fidelity version of this ancillary state. Now these things have a topological volume, they have a circuit volume, and it's measured in terms of these plumbing pieces. So we have a cube of edge length 5D on 4, where D is the error correction distance of our code, and we have a defect that sits in the middle with a circumference of D. So this allows us to sort of remove the, the details of the strength of error correction we need. We come back in and we, we fix that later. Um, the circuit itself can be written in sort of an ind independent form to the strength of error correction. And then once you've done it, you can plug in these numbers, calculate for the surface code, how many qubits you need, and how much time you need to enact this volume, or in the Rausendorf code, how many qubits you need in the 3D volume. So I'm going to go through two specific examples to show um, the mechanisms that are in the game. So this is the first one. This is just a Hadamard circuit. And we're going to do a Hadamard in this way here. So we're going to use three phase gates. So let's not worry about this classical correction because it's, it's not handled within the game and it doesn't need to be handled within the game. Uh, this is a different level of classical processing that takes care of this. But instead we have three phase gates and a C naught and running the circuit we can apply a Hadamard to this data set. We're going to express our initial circuit in this way here Basically, we're going to push these phase gates to the end by introducing three more qubit lines. And this is basically, we're going to teleport this phase gate. So that's this one here. This phase gate is that one there. 
and this phase gate here is that one there. So we're going to read it, write it down in that form, and then we're going to convert it into this. And now we have to try to optimize this. So let's go through and have a bit of a play. How is this going to? Okay, this might be a bit dark. I don't know if this will be turn off. Okay, it might come up a bit better. Let's see. With. So we've got a bunch of circuits already in this thing that we can play with. So the basic controls are quite simple. You have a right click and drag, and that's your camera angle. Um, either the scroll wheel or double on the track pattern of the map will do zoom. And then you have shift, left click and pan across here. And this allows you to put the, the circuit in a nice little window here. So what do we have in terms of these structures? Our backgrounds probably. A stylistic design that didn't end up working too well. We found it made, we found it made a lot of people nauseous. <laughs> this is very much a work in progress. This is still buggy. It's, not, it's nowhere near completed. This is a real sort of prototype thing uh, that we've still got a lot of work to do to make this something that we can release to the general public. So I'm looking at the top side of that original circuit here. So these double pair of defects here represent my input-output. And we have three sort of types of, of things going here. We've got sort of these solid blocks, which just represent the defect structures themselves. We have solid pyramids, which represent the injection points. So what happens in the cluster or in the surface code, you pick a given physical qubit, you rotate it into a, a rotated measured state, and you then expand it to encode it but then you have to clean it up because the error rate associated with that is then uh, the error rate on that, that vertex, that individual qubit that sits at the intersection point of these two pyramids. And just to make things easier from a coding point of view, we have these translucent pyramids. These translucent pyramids represent inputs, outputs to the actual circuit. So we need these structures in here because... Of course, we can't destroy the topology if it's an actual output. So what happens is if I try to drag this back and forth, we start hitting this other thing, and the game won't allow it to go any further. And this obviously makes sense because that's an actual output. I don't know what's coming after that, so I can't break any topology. So the game is designed to maintain the error correction distances that are required, so these defects need to be separated from each other by a fixed amount. So if I try, for example, to drag this, it's telling me you can see sort of the red starting to fade in and it will snap back to its original position. It won't allow you to get defects that are too close to each other. So the aim of the game is simply to make this structure smaller. Use continuous deformation rules and some other little tricks that I'll show you um, in order to make this structure as small as possible. So in the top corner here, we have the initial volume estimate and it's just basically a box that sits around the structure and we count how many of those plumbing piece elements um, are in the structure. So in this case there's 90. Um, and the score will update as you go. So the easiest set of moves that you have, the ones that are most natural, are the continuous deformation rule. So this circuit's topological, so just like a coffee cup to a donut, you can mould and stretch this provided you don't break the topology. So for example, I can grab this piece here, I can move it all the way to the Right, same with this one here, same with this one here. And this is usually the first step you take. You start taking each of these individual pieces and just bringing them in. Where are you? So if you hold down the control button as you click pieces, it will you know, select multiple pieces so you can move them at the same time. And generally after each move, so these little boxes here, if you hit the X button, it will just clean it up. So it will turn those pieces that you know, might have a little bit of a chop in them, and it will just clean them up and turn them into one structure. So we bring all of these in to start with. And you can see here we've got our little scoring sort of star box system that we've put in. Um, as you get to smaller and smaller sort of target volumes, so you can sort of see there's a sort of fadey purple box that sits around the whole structure. 
that's your current bounding box, it's your current volume, and then there's a sort of a flashing yellow one sort of sitting in the middle. This is sort of your next target for your, for your next scoring star. So as we come through, let me just make these things simpler and simpler. And now this is basically the first step. We've just pushed everything into the left and right as far as possible. And now we've got to start trying to squeeze it even further. So the first thing I'm going to do is start bringing these things down. Again, this is the interface is not perfect on this. The angle of your camera dictates whether I have you know, X and Y, X and Z, Y and X. Um, and that's basically dictated by you know, which direction you're looking at this thing from. And our first special move I'm going to show here, we're going to look at this structure. Where we've got a pyramid in a simple loop that's braided with this other structure. What is this from an information theory point of view? It's simply a teleportation circuit. So if you think of it for a moment, let's just say I spin this around. So I'm going to have... So this particular circuit is a Clifford circuit, so there's no preferred direction of time. So there's no temporal ordering in this circuit at all. You could imagine I'm processing in this direction, this direction, or this direction. It doesn't matter because it's all Clifford gates. There's no feed forward. So let's just assume I'm going to spin this around. So my pyramid's going to be here, and then I'm going to have this simple loop. Well, in terms of a quantum circuit, what is that? So I have my injection state here, which I'll call A. This is a dual defect, and it's largely arbitrary which ones you call primal and dual, but this is your dual defect being braided. So if you look at this structure, take this end as sort of being its initialization point. So it's a dual one, so I'm initializing it in the plus state. Then I'm braiding it here, so it's a C naught, where the dual axis control. And then I'm measuring that qubit out. It's its primal, it's in the Z basis. So you run through that, well, what is that? I'm just teleporting this to here. And that holds for any geom geometry of this type. If you have a simple loop con containing an injection point that is braided by one other object, you can take that structure, and we have some special controls here on the right, and this one here is teleport. So as I click that, I delete that entire loop and move the injection point straight onto the dual defect. That's equivalent. So now that I've done that, I can move this object around and I can start straightening things up a little bit. Oops. Do that. So this is again just standard topological continuous deformation. I'm just going to move these things around, clean this up. Leave it at that. And then we play effectively the same game with each of these other structures. So again, this is a simple loop containing an injection point that is braided. So I can teleport. And again, I'm going to clean this up. So this, where I'm moving a pyramid, I'm allowed to move the pyramid anywhere along the structure I want. The only place where you can't is when we'll see later and you have uh, a three-point junction. You can't move this point beyond that. And there's another button here that's move the injector, and it will basically just move it to anywhere along that structure that you want. So let's just try and do this quickly. The snapback tool is still not perfect, but again, we've still got a lot of work to do to make the interface nice on this. And then we do the same thing with this piece here. Teleport it onto the jewel. And start cleaning this up a little bit. Now we've just got this centerpiece, and again, this is all just playing the same game. So again, we've got a simple loop with a braid, so we're going to teleport that. Now this becomes a simple loop with a braid, so we can teleport that. And 
again, I'm not going to clean this up, although it might not work in a second. Then I'm going to start shrinking this in here. Now again, I've got a simple loop with a braid. I'm going to teleport that. This is again another teleport. That in. Oh, let's see if this does this without me simplifying it. No. Okay, it wants me to make it a little simpler looking before it allowed me to do it. Again, simple loop of the braid, and there you go. Now that is what a Hadamard gate looks like in its compactified form. So here we have our input and our output. We now have these teleported phase gates that occur if it connects the two defects together, it's a Z rotation. If it works along just one of them, it's an X rotation. So this is the standard Euler angle decomposition for a Hadamard. It's a pi on four rotation around Z, pi on four rotation around X, pi on four rotation around Z. So we've now gone from a volume 90 down to a volume equivalent 23. So now you could input what is the distance of the error correction code that I require. You could use those equations that I showed before and then calculate how many qubits you need in your lattice to do it. So there's quite a lot of power uh, in this technique in basically bringing down resources. Now there's one special rule that I haven't detailed and I'm going to show this one yeah, it's a little bit of time. We're going to do this example to show a very, very unique, and this is unique to, the, to this model of computation. Um, but it's very a quick question before you go. Yeah. Somebody gave you the initial braid and the final thing and claimed that they are the same. Is there a, a way to check that? Yes, we believe, we haven't put this up on the app, we're finishing the paper now, we believe that we do have a verification technique. Um, I can talk about it a bit later, but yes, if, if I gave you a compressed structure and said, <coughs> If I gave you this circuit and the compressed structure yeah. and said they're equivalent, there is a way, we believe, to check that they are equivalent without you having to provide me every single step of the compression. Yeah, we believe we know how to do that. It relates, I'll try and talk about it a bit tomorrow, it relates to the structure of the ICM representation and then inverting it and doing stabiliser stuff. It's actually, I think it's similar to what Anne might be talking about in regards to verification of blind quantum computing. It's very similar to that. It's just within the, the, the framework of this. So the last one I want to show you is probably what the most powerful tool is in this compression. Um, it's what's called bridging. Um, so this was the state distillation circuit in order to do a phase gate. Um, this is its canonical form within the game. Uh, this one's, in the game, it's the steam circuit. Um, I'm going to skip a few steps. I'm instead going to jump to this one, which is called distill. It's basically this circuit mapped to this using the techniques I've already showed you. So the continuous deformation and the teleportations will get you from here to here. We're going to start with this circuit because um, we can shrink this even further. So in this case, what we've already done is we've used continuous deformation and teleportation of the seven um, injection points that exist in the original circuit um, for each of the seven qubits in the steam block. We have four of them sitting on the primal array. So roughly speaking, the primal arrays always run sort of left to right, and the dual qubits that are doing the braiding run top to bottom. Um, that's why you don't need to maintain the same separation between sort of the blue coloured ones and the non-blue coloured ones. So you can see here the distance between, say, that structure and any primal structure is less than the distance between any two primal structures this is because error chains in the topological code have to begin and end <coughs> on the same type of defect. So you can't have an error chain that begins on a primal and ends on a dual. It always has to end on another primal. Um, and we've teleported three of the injection points onto the dual qubits as part of the initial compression and our output is actually this little yellow loop that sits here. This is now the actual output of my distilled <coughs> circuit. Again, this is an all Clifford circuit, so there's no time axis on this. This, this can be implemented in any one of the three dimensions. Um, if we have time at the end and people want to ask about 
um, enforcing temporal ordering. I can say something about that, but I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that tomorrow. So the technique that ends up being quite powerful is what I call, or what we call bridging. The general rule is with bridging, is provided any two loops are closed, and they have to be loops of the same type, so they either have to be both primal or both dual, provided those loops are closed, i.e. they're not inputs and outputs of your actual circuit, you're allowed to connect them with a single bridge. So the way we do this in the game is we first take this little icon here, which is a split function. This just allows you to basically have a long piece and just cut it. So I'm just going to cut it here, so now I've just got a single little block. Now I'm going to highlight these two blocks, one at the bottom here and this one, and down here I've got a bridge function. So that will simply connect them. Now you can see the colors change. They're now the same structure itself, but they're both closed loops, so I'm allowed to connect them together. Now you have to do a little bit of squinting to see what's going to happen next. And this is a special function. It's the last one down here that we call switching, but this really shouldn't be a separate function because it is still continuous deformation, what I'm about to do next. Imagine taking this point here where it connects. I'm going to drag that defect along here. So there's nothing to intersect it in the middle, so I'm allowed to take this piece, move it along here, turn it around the corner. That's what this next function is going to do. So if I take that piece, hit the switching button, and then drag this piece up, you can see that that opens up this region here. So basically just taking this piece and moved it around. But now an interesting thing starts happening is that we've now opened up some space. So I can take these two structures and push them in. This one I can push in. This one I'm just going to move out of the way. <coughs> and then move this one in. And as you start bridging, so now I've got this dark blue loop here and this sort of aqua colored loop here. Again, they're both closed loops. So I can take this point and I can take this point and I can again bridge. And then the switching function again does the same thing. I'm going to take that piece and drag it along and open it up again. I was actually done it in the other direction, but that's all right. It's topologically equivalent. So now I've basically removed that entire structure there. Now I can shrink this, and once again, what do we have? We have a injection point, a loop with a single braid, and a measurement. So I can teleport and delete that structure itself. So what ends up happening is you end up getting quite a large amount of resource savings because these structures get more and more compact. And what ends up happening in the end, if you keep going through piece by piece by piece, is you end up building this sort of mesh. One part of the mesh is just a single primal defect that might have injection points all over it. And then you've got sort of entangled within it as a ball of string, you've got a dual cage, again, that might have injection points <coughs> that ultimately represent the original algorithm you started from. So if I pull up slides from the last time I spoke on this. This is how you get from this original structure to this thing, which has order and over, over an order of magnitude um, better volume estimates. Again, if you want to then specify your error correction distance and then say, well, how many qubits do I need to do this versus how many qubits do I need to do this? So, this sort of mesh of a, a primal and dual cage scattered with injection points is a result of, of bridging. So you first bridge along all your jewels and then try to compact it as much as possible. You then bridge all of your primals where you're allowed to and then ultimately you get to these two cages. And in this particular case, there would be that translucent pyramid there, which is now my final output. What's, what's the intuition between why, why bridging is allowed? Well, the basic idea, and there's a formal proof in the paper with Austin, is that if you have two closed loops, you can add a tadpole to a closed loop, and it doesn't change anything. The correlation surface just extends over the tadpole, closes back up. If you have two of these things together, one loop becomes the tadpole of the other loop. 
So the, the mapping to correlation surfaces and the, the, the bits and pieces of information that you have to keep track of as you're implementing this, trust me, is complicated. Are there, are there still, if, if you cut a plane through that, are, are, are you, do you still have to cut through uh, four, four tubes or not? Cut a plane, I'm not sure. Okay, so, you cut, you cut through, so if you cut through two loops, you're going to cut through four. So what, if I cut through here? Yeah, if you cut through there, you can cut through four for two loops, right? Yeah. Is it, st is it still four when you do this bridging, or is it less? No, well, it's basically, so in this case here, say this structure, the correlation surface that you consider is the sheet, because you've initialized in a fixed basis on this other side, right. measuring in a fixed basis on this side. So the correlation surface you have to track is now the sheet right. across this. Now, same with this one here. When you bridge and now um, move these things out the way, what you end up getting is the defects act as sort of termination points for the sheet. So as you move around, you will have to take into account where these things move. Now, you end up sometimes combining correlation surfaces. That's fine, because the correlation surfaces are about, I've got all these X basis measurements, and I have to group them together. So if it's the Rausendorf lattice, sorry, you've got X basis measurements that you're doing everywhere in the bulk. You then group these classical results together to identify the correlation surfaces in the structure. So it's about when I want to track the logical state from input, or from this case injection points, to output, what sets of classical measurements do I need in order to get the right correction operators? So there's a classical correction or a Pauli correction that has to occur for each correlation mm -hmm. surface. And you just have to know which sets you need to group together. And when you do a bridging, that's what you're effectively doing. Your sort of having two embedded correlation surfaces and you've got two sets. And then you use whichever set is needed depending on which operator you're tracking. There's a whole backside. I mean, the classical backside of this is enormous. And we haven't even started writing the, the software to do it. I understand why, the, why what you're saying about the basic bridge and why it doesn't affect the correlation surfaces. I'm not sure I'll, I, I, I lose some of the intuition when you start putting some, some of the, the changes. Yeah, I mean, we can sit down and talk about it a bit more. Um, yeah, it, it's about measurements in the bulk, what measurements correspond to correlation surfaces of certain logical operator mappings in the stabilizer set. And then when I track through this circuit, how do I correct outputs? Or how do I interpret outputs? Um, yeah, it's, it's nasty. Alexandra's done a bit of work, sort of stage one work, of trying to map these geometric structures, scan through them to identify all supported correlation surfaces, and therefore define qubit sets, and saying well, this set is needed for this, and this set is needed for that. After you make the bridge, it seems that you could move that quite freely. Uh, the, the, the loop. Once you've made the bridge, um, standard continuous deformation rules kick in. So once you've connected the bridge, which is a discrete move, you're again only allowed to move those new edges dependent on standard continuous deformation. So you know, I can move it through. If, if there's any intersection by anything else, I'm not allowed to, to move through that. So yeah, bridging is the, the discrete move that is unique to this model of computation. It's not a continuous deformation move. Everything else basically is. Um, the teleportation is, again, appealing to what's going on at the information level. Um, and then when, as I said before, with these injection points, when you start bridging, you start getting these three-point junctions. And another rule is you can't move an injection point past a junction. Um, you can move it anywhere along here, but in this one, you can move anywhere along here. But as soon as you hit this three-point junction here or here, you can't move it any further. So the game client itself, it's still buggy. Um, this was only basically a proof of principle prototype. Um, we still we launched a Kickstarter about a month and a half ago. Unfortunately, it failed. Um, so now we have to figure out some different uh, method of funding because our team or our team that helped uh, build this first version. Um, we got professionals in. 
we got professional game designers and digital artists to come in and actually help us do that. And we want to continue down that road. Um, the physics side of this is pretty much done. There's a physics engine that sits under this thing that enforces all of these rules. Um, We've been trying to find bugs with it. There is one thing that we haven't implemented yet, and it's basically a, an inversion. So if I've got a braid that comes through, and I've sort of got this one going underneath it and this one going above, the one rule we haven't implemented yet is that you can flip them. You can have this one going above and this one going below. But that's pretty much the only rule left in the library that we haven't coded in. So the physics side's pretty much done. It's now the game design. I mean, we want this thing to be popular, and we want to not only have a large database of people playing it, but retain those players. It shouldn't just be somebody jumping on, having a go, and then never coming back again. We want them to actually play and to continue playing. So we've got some ideas behind, you know, sort of uh, social media interaction, competitive game play, cooperative game play that would all happen in real time. Um, all the data we're intending to collect. So it's not just, you know, I'm going to make this smaller and submit a solution. We're going to track exactly how they're solving these things. Because that's ultimately what we want to know. There are some specific examples of large circuits that maybe you could um, find some very, very good solutions to. Uh, I can't remember what this one is. So this is an older version, unfortunately. So um, This, I think, if I remember correctly, was from a PhD thesis, this is a distillation circuit as well. I can't remember what state it distills. It's again another state distillation circuit. This one's quite large. There's some larger circuits in there. As I said, tomorrow we'll talk about time ordering. Um, in this circuit there is a time ordering that occurs because it's not a fully Clifford circuit. It's distilling a non-Clifford state. But we can talk about that a bit more tomorrow. But yes, hopefully in the future we'll be able to get some more money. Um, and turn this into a, a proper and fun game that will hopefully allow us to generate the data that we need to build these more complicated optimizers for the surface code. So thanks. Questions for Simon? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's, cer there's certainly algorithmic techniques that you could use to, use to do this. And to be honest, we don't know for sure that this is a computation hard problem. We don't know. We suspect that it's related to 3D bin packing. So when we start talking about a circuit that would be far too large to visualize, um, I can show you the circuit diagram for a Toffoli gate with two layers of concatenated state distillation. It's huge. You couldn't program that into a game. If it is, in fact, computationally hard to do it, then we need these heuristics first, in some way. Um, sure, so part of what you're trying to do is to, 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 actually, to actually have those people help you discover those heuristics, right? Yeah, ultimately. But yes, these, these first yeah, steps. Yeah, just saying, make it more fun so the users aren't doing it in the past. Yeah, 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 exactly. And we had talked about this, that when, when you start off with something like this, you'd have like a, a simplified button on here, and it would do these sort of trivial push-in effects, so you don't have to go through and one after the other do it. Yeah, we've talked about that. Maybe one more question while Matt sets up his computer. Yeah, Nadine. Um, so, in terms of the uh, size of Yeah, this links into what Martin was asking about verification, is that, yes, we can formulate the initial circuit structure so that it's Clifford rotated basis measurements. And all of this sort of topological stuff is just the Clifford component. So then, yes, it's all stabiliser. You can map out efficiently exactly what that circuit is doing. But then you use that structure in order to verify the compressed version to check if the compressed version is still doing the same thing. I don't know if that answers... So I 
question maybe I had was whether you can actually save the work. Is it possible to export it back into a SketchUp file? Or yeah, the code exists to do it. Okay. Um, yes. Is so it available publicly again? No, it's not available publicly yet. Um, we've got code that allows us to translate an arbitrary circuit into this geometric file. So anything consisting of arbitrary rotations, control not, control V to follow lead. We've got a compilation software that will generate the geometric structures, and I'll talk about that tomorrow. We haven't put anything up on the web that goes the other way yet. Well, thanks again. Yeah, the color seems to be kind of messed up.